And now we finally arrived at our last topic, video compression, which I think is a great way to tie together all of the various threads of this course. But like a lot of our recent topics, this could pretty much be a course to itself. But unlike a lot of our previous topics, this actually is a course to itself. If you go and take ECE 483 at UVic, that is a course in digital video processing, which spends a great deal of its time, at, at least if what I've seen by looking up old course outlines is correct, spends a great deal of its time talking about the very techniques I'm going to talk about in this lecture, in what I assume is a great deal more detail than I am. So I'll leave it to them. I'm not gonna step on their toes too much. I will try and stay in my lane, just like I did in the last lecture with a discrete cosine transform. Our goal is to use video compression as the end of our case study into lossy compression and a way of combining together the various lossless and lossy techniques we've seen over this semester in a setting where it's important to both achieve compression, but also to achieve performance. Because when you're compressing video at, let's say, 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, it's one thing to write a compression tool that can save you space. But it's not just that. You have to compress each frame and decompress each frame pretty quickly because the next frame is going to get here before you know it. So this lecture is going to talk a little bit about that as well. And we'll notice in this lecture, more so than in previous ones, we have to address that trade-off between getting the best compression and just doing the best we can with the time that we have. So first, if I want to compress video, I could observe that, unfortunately, I guess there's no such thing as magic. It turns out that what we call video, what we perceive as motion, is actually just a bunch of still images. When you're watching a video at 30 frames per second, you are being shown a bunch of still images. Okay, well, that's sort of liberating in the sense that it means we don't have to start video compression from scratch. I could just take my stream of video data and treat it as a sequence of still images. So, I mean, I guess I could apply a lossy compression scheme to each of my frames of video independently. There's something interesting hiding under the surface here, a sort of luxury that we've only had for the last, I don't know, couple of decades talking about video compression, which is that previously, so going back to the analog transmission era, so broadcast television 50 years ago or so, or, or longer, um, it wasn't really the case that a video was just a sequence of discrete still images. There was something funny that happened called interlacing, where a particular frame of video would actually arrive sort of tangled up with the next frame of video, uh, it, to oversimplify things. And that meant that schemes that processed video, analog and digital, had a little bit more work to do. But we don't have to worry about that so much in 2023. We could actually treat the stream of video frames as just a bunch of independent images. The problem is, if we do that, we run into real trouble with bandwidth. So I, I've been uh, parroting this statistic all semester, but if we think about a single frame of 1080p video, so 1080p is this resolution, it is the resolution of the video that you are watching right now, assuming you're watching it at the highest quality YouTube makes it available. Uh, traditionally, we actually call the 1080p resolution an example of an HD or high definition resolution which is sort of quaint in 2023 because these days we sort of view 1080p or the related also high definition resolution 720p as sort of a lower bound. Unless we're watching videos on a mobile device, we sort of expect that if you're creating a video for publication purposes, you make it at at least 1080p. So while in 2020, I might have been able to brag that I record my videos like this one in glorious 1080p, that's a little bit mundane these days. So when I talk about 1080p video, I'm not really talking about top of the line resolution. These days, if you're recording, if you're creating some sort of video production, um, you're likely editing the video at a much higher resolution resolution than 1080p, and you may well be distributing it at a much higher resolution. But anyway, whatever. Suppose I'm talking about 1080p video, a relatively modest resolution by the standards of 2023. If I encode that frame of video in 24-bit RGB, so 8 bits per color channel, it's going to require, for just one frame, 6 megabytes. And of course, I have brought this up over and over again during this course, whenever I need to justify that compression is something we really need in practice for everyday applications like video compression. Okay, so here we are again. 
Now you might by now know enough to look at that and say, yeah, but we're not going to encode it in 24-bit RGB. That's not fair. We, sh we shouldn't talk about the encoding, uh, the bandwidth needed for 24-bit RGB when we know full well that we're probably going to subsample and use a different color system. Okay, fair enough. Suppose we use 420 subsampling. <clears throat> And I assume that means we're using YCBCR, but who cares? We're using some kind of subsampling technique. Um, if we use 420 subsampling, then the total size comes down to 3.1 megabytes. So in other words, we're storing one of the color planes at full resolution, and then the other two color planes were scaling down each dimension by a factor of two. Okay, so that comes out to be three megabytes instead of six megabytes. That's still pretty nasty. We still can't get away with that. I talked a bit about the bandwidth constraints of a typical internet connection in lecture 17. This is not going to do the trick. But on the other hand, we also know that if we're treating our video stream as a sequence of still images, we of course would apply some kind of lossy transformation, some kind of lossy compression scheme to it. So you know, I guess we also should think about what that could do for us. So suppose that I take all of my frames of video, let's say 30 frames per second, and I subsample them, and then I compress them using JPEG. Uh, and so, uh, as a rule of thumb, and you'll notice this video is rife with these rules of thumb that I just sort of make up, basically. I, I get them from nowhere. Um, and that's because a lot of the knowledge that we need for video compression, we sort of have to trust the experts. I mean, we can talk about the techniques, we can talk about transformations, but as far as empirical data collected from real video, we don't want to collect that ourselves. So we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to rely quite a bit on rules of thumb provided by video and image compression experts in this lecture. But as a rule of thumb, JPEG can typically achieve a compression ratio of 10 with very little quality degradation. So I, I think it's reasonable then, at, at just to ballpark it, that maybe we could get a frame into 300k. It turns out even 300k is not great. That's not going to do enough for us as far as uh, being able to stream video over a typical internet connection. Um, I'm, also, I'm also going to observe that once we get into techniques that are specific to video compression, that is, examples being, I guess, that one frame of video tends to be rather similar to the next frame of video, we should expect to be able to amplify this compression ratio substantially, as we'll see, maybe by halfway through this lecture. So if I were to use 30 frames per second, and then I use JPEG with an approximate compression ratio of 10, then for a 30 frame per second 1080p video, I need... 9.3 megabytes per second. And although we, we might have been at the previous slide saying, oh, three megabytes, oh, 300 kilobytes, these numbers don't look too big. Remember that we're talking about bytes per second, not bits per second. We typically measure our internet speeds at bits per second. This comes out to be just about 75 megabits per second, 74 and some megabits per second. Recall, as I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, that we are lucky if we can get a home internet connection. So 93% of Canadian households have the option of buying a home internet connection that, that um, is labeled as providing 50 megabits per second, keeping in mind that you're unlikely to actually get sustained speeds of 50 megabits per second on such a connection. So 74 megabits per second seems like a bit of a tall order. If I were to drop down to 720p, which is still called HD resolution, although by today's standard it's a pretty modest standard issue resolution um, with subsampling, I would end up with 33 megabits per second, which is still pretty bad. Um, so if I contrast this, again, relying on the experts here, not that I consider YouTube, I mean, YouTube is one arm of a massive corporation who knows whether they're giving us... Um, neutrally sourced data, but frankly, we, we all use YouTube for things, so I suppose we can trust them to some extent to give us a rule of thumb. Um, if you go and look at YouTube's upload guidelines, there's a link there, um, they recommend that if you're capturing video for the sake of upload, um, that you capture it in 8 megabits per second for 1080p 30 and 5 megabits for 720p. That, that's the um, upload guidelines. YouTube is probably sending the video out at less than 8 megabits per second in some cases. It's recommending that for high quality, you capture the video in 8 megabits per second. Contrast that to 75 megabits per second if we attempted to use JPEG with, um, I guess, a bunch of rules of thumb that imply we're going to get pretty high quality. There's a pretty massive difference there. That's a factor of almost 10. So that's what this lecture is talking about. We won't be able to cover many of these techniques in, in minute detail. We also really aren't going to be able to get into the minutia of the very complicated compression schemes used, for example, by YouTube or modern streaming sites. Uh, but we can talk about a lot of the techniques that are used in a lot of modern schemes that date back many years, just like how we, we discussed deflate and bzip earlier in the course, only to learn that deflate and are still in very wide use. 
So, of course, we could compress video streams as a sequence of still images, and there are cases where you actually would do that. For certain forms of video editing, that actually might be helpful to, to a limited extent, uh, maybe less so now than it was in the past. Um, a long time ago, for digital video editing on a computer, when computers were slow uh, and didn't have very much processing time or memory to spare, um, wasting a huge amount of disk space with a poor compression scheme that uh, gave you high quality but a very, low a very bad compression ratio uh, might have been been a good idea so you don't waste too much time decompressing the video every time you want to skim through it. These days we've got so much processing time it's not as big of a deal. But in any event, whether, we, uh, whether it's a good idea to use still images or not, we're wasting a lot of potential compression advantage because in general, in a typical video, two consecutive frames of video are extremely highly correlated. Um, we can take it to a particular extreme in this video here. So ever since I last drew on the screen about five or ten seconds ago, every single frame of video that you have seen has been identical. So they, just, they haven't just been highly correlated, they have been identical to each other. Because of course you're watching a very specific kind of video right now, a video of me pontificating over more or less still images. Um, but it's also true that in full motion, like live action video, so a recording of real events, so a, a series of photographic still frames, it's likely that consecutive frames are correlated. Because, you know, if you have 30 frames per second, how much can change in 1 30th of a second? So certainly having a scheme that can leverage the relationships between frames, take advantage of this correlation, will probably give us a compression advantage. And in a sense, we can actually think about this almost like, okay, so we did image compression, that's one still image, um, and of course we were compressing an image, treating it as a 2D array of pixels, we can almost think about a stream of images forming a video as adding an extra dimension. Maybe we're turning this into a 3D array of pixels, and that third dimension is time. And we can expect, just like how neighboring pixels in an image are probably correlated, um, if we look across that third dimension of time, uh, pixels that neighbor in time are likely very highly correlated. Um, now, it's worth noting, I'll come back to this a couple of times during this lecture, but if I compress video for broadcast purposes or for streaming, there are a couple of extra requirements for convenience. Um, for example, if, I, if you're talking about live streamed video, so a stream that could run for hours or days at a time, it's pretty likely that some Somebody might tune in halfway through that stream. Uh, you sort of want to have a compression scheme that allows for that. So we, we don't want to be leveraging correlations that go all the way back to frame number zero, which could have been days in the past, for certain purposes. For storing video in a file on disk, maybe we don't care as much about that, but certainly for streaming video, we probably want the ability for a, a viewer to tune in midway through, or maybe a viewer that loses connection to reconnect. Um, I'll come back to that a bit. At the very end of this lecture, I'll talk about sort of one overarching topic that often comes into play for those applications. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, at a high level about techniques used in schemes. Uh, and there are, of course, some extremely advanced techniques that I won't have the chance to get to in, in, in a single lecture in a course like this. Um, most of the compression schemes used today stem from uh, compression schemes developed by this group. So you might notice the parallel here um, between the Joint Photographic Experts Group, or JPEG, and the Motion Picture Experts Group, or MPEG. Um, that's because they were almost working in parallel. They were developing these standards around the same time. So the first MPEG video standard, which is called MPEG-1, uh, came of age around the same time as Deflate and JPEG. Uh, and it was designed to uh, deal with some constraints for, to, I, I guess, the ex expected venues for compressed video at the time. Uh, for example, storing um, reasonably high quality video uh, on a CD, on a compact disc, something that still exists today, but we no longer worry about too much as a medium for, for compressed video. A lot of video compression schemes have existed over the years that are not MPEG video schemes. Many of the widely used video compression schemes today are not MPEG video schemes, but the MPEG um, standards continue to advance. There are a lot of widely used video standards used today that are descendants of MPEG-1 that are also called MPEG something, so MPEG-4, MPEG-H, MPEG-I. Um, the scheme that is probably being used to compress this video that you're watching right now on YouTube is probably a scheme probably called either VP9 or AV1, which um, is a renamed version of the standard that would previously have been called VP10, but was renamed. 
Um, those are standards that aren't afflicted by the same patent issues as the MPEG standards. And over time, it appears as if MPEG standards are getting so bogged down by patents that we're noticing a lot of work going into developing video compression standards that aren't encumbered by patents. Not just work in the open source community, but large corporations like Google are investing in developing schemes that aren't encumbered by patents because they see the value in having schemes that don't, where there's no need to pay royalties depending on how you use them. Which is interesting because that's something we've also seen a lot in this course, how a viable scheme can slowly die out because people get sick of paying the royalties. Or maybe what, whether they're paying royalties or not, they get sick of that constant anxiety that someday they're going to receive a demand letter from somebody else's lawyers saying, hi, it turns out the scheme you're using is patented, money please. So in any event, whether or not modern schemes that you might be likely to use are MPEG schemes, Modernly, modern schemes owe a lot to MPEG schemes, including, uh, and especially, I would argue, MPEG-1. So there were plenty of contemporary video compression schemes to MPEG-1, but it seems as if maybe because of the rigor of the standard, maybe because of the way it was adopted, a lot of modern schemes seem to trace their lineage back to the early MPEG schemes. Okay, so I'm going to trace through, I guess, give a brief history lesson about MPEG and other video compression schemes over time, uh, and we'll start with MPEG-1. So MPEG-1 came out, it was formalized in 1993. The goal was to compress, again, this sort of nebulous VHS quality video. So as I mentioned in a previous video, VHS is a now rather archaic format that was used to reco record analog video. So it's sort of hard to give a direct comparison between the quality you'd see by playing back a VHS tape, which is magnetic tape, which had analog video signals on it, versus playing back a digital file. But generally, a VHS quality is regarded as being 30 frames per second, um, more or less. So it actually turns out that broadcast uh, color video in the US and Canada is at this frame rate, but we're just going to talk, we're, we're going to truncate that to an integer. We'll round that to 30. Um, and VHS quality was considered to be either this resolution or this one, depending on what part of the world you were in. So um, in other parts of the world, analog television actually had different resolutions. Um, I have referred in a previous video to VHS quality. If you want a digital comparator for that, for this resolution, which would be the North American VHS resolution as far as MPEG was concerned, you might use the term today, in today's terminology, 240p. Uh, and so that's to contrast with 1080p. I mentioned in a previous video that for all we know, YouTube might even let you, if you change the quality selector, choose 240p to see just how bad that quality is. I since checked that. It looks like YouTube doesn't do that. It will let you go very low with resolution. It lets you go down to 144p. You can try that out on this video and see if you like it. I'll bet you won't. Um, and then it'll let you go up to 480p. But as far as I know, YouTube doesn't support 240p. Um, so whatever, you can maybe interpolate, get some idea of that quality by trying out these two resolutions. I'd say by modern standards, they're not considered to be very good quality. They might be fine for a mobile device or something, but certainly we can see the first MPEG standard was designed for resolutions far below what we would consider acceptable today. The idea behind the first MPEG standard, I guess their goal, their, their target as far as what they were trying to produce was to be able to encode a um, video at this VHS quality resolution, so 240p or 288p in, in, in um, other parts of the world, um, along with an audio track. So one issue with video compression is often we have to talk about how we can interleave video and audio signals. Um, we wanted it so that the combination of video and audio signal together, the compressed video and audio tracks together, required 1.4 megabits per second. And this was because that was the data rate of compact disks. So the compact disk format, the CD format, was a format developed um, I guess in the late 70s and around 1980. And it was designed to store digital audio, but uncompressed digital audio. So it would be digital audio at this uh, 44,100 hertz. Um, and uh, it would be 8-bit resolution, so 8 bits uh, per sample, and then two channels, so stereo. And it turns out if you work that out, you get a data rate of about 1.4 megabits per second. And so CD players were designed to be able to play back CDs, reading the digital data off the disk at 1.4 megabits per second. The target of the first MPEG standard was to be able to encode audio and video with compression, such that the result had acceptable resolution and also fit within that data rate. The idea being to use CDs as a medium for digital video. 
video. Something that they were able to do, but that never really caught on. So I remember the first time I used like a DVD player in the early 2000s, it did support playing back video CDs, although there didn't seem to be too much of a market for those in North America. My understanding is that there was more of a market for video CDs and, and other discs other than DVDs in, in Japan and other parts of the world, um, maybe because a lot of the manufacturers developing these things, including the manufacturers developing CDs, were based in Japan and therefore more of the innovation found its way to that market versus us. Who knows? But the MPEG standard was designed around that idea. So that was called MPEG-1. Later in the 1990s, a standard came out called MPEG-2, and this is a good point to add that MPEG, these MPEG standards are these massive standards documents that cover all sorts of video-related topics. They also recover audio compression, so talking about just MPEG-2 by itself doesn't necessarily narrow down exactly what combination of video compression, audio compression, and um, multiplexing that you might be using. So the MPEG-2 standard was pretty expansive, and later MPEG standards have only gotten larger. But in any event, later in the 90s, uh, a standard came out called MPEG-2 that defined a variety of different video and audio encoding schemes for different use cases, including the one that ended up being adopted for DVD video. And, that, and that's something that probably people still remember today. DVDs, so DVD originally stood for digital video disc, but they noticed later that if they want to use DVDs for other purposes, that sort of boxed them in, so they changed the V to stand for versatile. And you can tell that that's sort of a back formation. So digital versatile disc, okay. Um, typically these days, if we talk about MPEG-2, we usually are talking about the particular particular combination of MPEG-2 video and audio encoding schemes that was used by DVDs and by digital broadcast television signals, so digital cable and digital over-the-air television. And that still happens today. There, there actually are still signals being sent out as I speak in July of 2023 that are using the MPEG-2 standard. Um, and one thing we'll notice with video compression standards is because a lot of video encoding and decoding is done by hardware, so I mean, think about digital cable, that's a cable box that you'd be plugging into the wall. Um, because it's done by hardware, um, technology doesn't march forward as quickly as it might uh, with desktop or laptop computers. So, I mean, what you can decode in a web browser, that can change pretty easily over time because it's a matter of updating software, up to limitations of your hardware's ability to decode video quickly. Whereas digital broadcast television standards uh, are designed for hardware decoding and therefore lag pretty substantially behind the, the, the leading edge of technology. So on MPEG-2 stream, MPEG-2 was designed to be transmitted at what was then called standard definition. And I guess the idea behind standard definition, this term, was it was meant to be a digital realization of the resolution of analog broadcast television. And the resolution was 720 by 480. One thing you may observe about this is that the, the aspect ratio seems a bit strange, because recall that old-fashioned analog televisions were typically not widescreen. They were typically 4 by 3 resolution, um, whereas this does not seem to be like that. This doesn't seem to be basically, this seems a bit stretched. And one thing weird about the transition from analog to digital signals that persists even today with 1080p video is that actually the, the um, size of the frame may not match the aspect ratio of the video. So that is, the pixels that are encoded end up being rendered in a way that makes them look sort of rectangular and not square. For our purposes, we're not going to worry about that, but yes, I I'm aware of that, and you might notice that too, that that is just a strange um, uh, effect of, of the standards process. So in any event, this was considered to be the resolution of digital of analog broadcast television at full quality. Um, analog broadcast television was tr transmitted in a format called interlaced. So it was transmitted at nominally 30 or 29.97 frames per second, but actually each frame was a combination of two different sort of subframes. So one 720 by 480 frame would be alt would be uh, each line of the frame alternated back and forth between lines of a different field of the source image. Um, so actually, although it was transmitted as 30 frames per second, it would correspond to 60 fields per second of video. So the video would change 60 times per Per second. It's just that each uh, a pair of fields would be would be interlaced together into one frame. That wasn't a very good explanation, but it doesn't make much of a difference because we're not going to worry about that. Um, as of the late 1990s, when DVDs came into wide use and digital broadcast television came of age, um, what was called progressive uh, scan images uh, became the norm um, over time. 
and that's what we work with today. So that's why we talk about 1080p versus just 1080 resolution. It's because there was once this distinction between interlaced and progressive video, a distinction we are now going to completely ignore. So these days we consider our video to be progressive, which means that each frame is a separate image and there's no business of, of combining two frames together via interlacing. So we're going to talk about video compression only from that point of view. If we had to compress interlaced video, that would make our lives a lot harder because a lot of the manipulations we would perform um, would mess up the interlacing. So fortunately, we don't have to do that. If you want to look into interlacing, it is actually a really fascinating topic why they had to use interlaced scan for video. And it goes back to the way that digital broadcast, or sorry, analog broadcast television was invented, basically. So, so maybe a hundred years ago. Uh, the MPEG-2 standard also contains, as I mentioned, these MPEG standards are pretty expansive. It also contains the description of several audio compression schemes. One of those audio compression schemes, called MPEG-2 Layer 3, um, was later, so somebody devised a way of storing that in its own container by itself, just as a stream of audio, and they called that format .mp3. Um, and in so doing, by encoding audio with this MP3 audio format, which is short for, strangely, MPEG-2 Layer 3, Three, um, they created this standalone audio format that, in my opinion, began the revolution in um, file sharing and uh, streaming audio that has resulted today in us being able to use streaming services like Spotify. There was a long, complicated history there, one that I actually remember experiencing growing up. So as a kid, I um, one day somebody introduced me to a program, at that point a free program, called Napster, and since then there have been all sorts of interesting books and movies made about this. The name Napster still exists because somebody bought the trademark and they now run, I think, some kind of streaming service with that name, but as usual with these names, it doesn't really have much of a connection to its original genesis as this program that a college student wrote. Um, and Napster was a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing program where people could encode their, um, their library of audio files, usually using the .mp3 format, which was very high quality. It allowed you to encode a three-minute song into approximately maybe a three megabyte file, um, whereas previously it might be 30 or 40 megabytes uncompressed. Um, and a three megabyte file was not a fun download on, with the download speeds in the late 1990s, but it was a doable download. It would take you a few minutes um, or it would take you half an hour or something, but you could do it. So people would use Napster to share their library of audio files that they had extracted from CDs and stored in MP3 format. And I remember being introduced to Napster uh, when I was a kid and using it and being amazed by it because back then, if I wanted to listen to a particular song, I had to wait for it to, to play on the radio or I had to go out and buy it, uh, like buy a CD with a bunch of other songs on it that maybe I didn't quite want to listen to. So using Napster to download songs was amazing, and a lot of other people seemed to think it was amazing as well. And that's one reason that the music industry came down very hard on that. Now I have a lot of opinions about to what extent they were in the right. Uh, I don't know that I agree with them to a large extent on some stuff, but one way or another, Napster became a non-entity very quickly. It got sued out of existence, and then the name got bought up by a large music publisher in a pretty classic, I, I don't know, this is one of those weird legal turnarounds that you see a lot in life, and that music publisher then later turned it into a streaming service. So they, they leveraged that name. They ended up with the name as a result of this lawsuit, whatever. Um, so uh, the MPEG video standard collection actually resulted in a revolution in audio sharing and audio streaming as well. And I should add that once it became clear to the music industry that being able to download audio was incredibly convenient to people and they wanted to do it, that, that actually there was a market there for people to be able to share audio over the internet, that began, I think, the progression that led to audio streaming becoming, as far as I can tell, the dominant form of um, music enjoyment for a lot of people. I mean, I don't really listen to broadcast radio that much anymore, I mean, except if I'm in public and I sort of hear it over loudspeakers or something. Um, and to, I don't go out and buy albums either. I have a subscription to a, scream, a streaming service, which is convenient enough, and I listen to all my music that way. And I think that that revolution was sparked by the MP3 format in the late 1990s. Um, so what's interesting about this, and it sort of speaks to the fact that the MPEG standards are full of different ideas, not all of which were used. MP3 was defined, it was formalized in the MPEG-2 standard. And the MPEG committee did not invent MP3. MP3 was developed, I think it was actually the PhD thesis of somebody in the 90s, and later it got folded in in a formal sense to the MPEG-2 standard, and that's where it got its name, MPEG-2 Layer 3. Although MP3 was defined in that standard, um, it wasn't used as the audio codec for DVDs or 
digital broadcast television. They used a different MPEG-2 audio compression format. Um, and that's because there were lots of audio compression formats provided in the MPEG-2 standard. Um, and interestingly, MP MP3 didn't get adopted for... Um, to be multiplexed against video to a widespread sense uh, until later on when people began sharing video files in the MPEG-4 era. So often MP3 was used as the audio codec for that. Uh, as far as I'm aware, as of 2023, I don't believe that MPEG-3 or MP3 ever became used uh, in a widely adopted uh, official medium for compressed video. Uh, so by the time that um, the audio compression format used in the MPEG uh, in DVDs and broadcast video became obsolete, there were even better audio Audio compression formats that then superseded MP3. So MP3 uh, went on to live a long life and a life that continues today for audio only compression, but strangely never actually quite caught on in the way that you'd expect in its, ori in its original setting, except to the extent I'm about to discuss uh, that is relevant to MPEG-4. So MPEG-2 was used with, with the original generation of HD video encoding for digital broadcast and DVDs, and MPEG-2 continues to be supported even in things like Blu-ray uh, for high-definition video encoding, at least high definition up to like 1080p and stuff. Um, a later standard called MPEG-4, so you might be wondering, where is the MPEG-3 standard? My recollection is there was a standard that was named MPEG-3, but it didn't introduce any new video compression schemes. I think it was mostly concerned with things like container formats um, and ways of incorporating stuff like closed captioning or subtitles. So there's a standard called MPEG-4. This was the early 2000s, uh, although MPEG-4 sort of was released over time. Uh, it contained, described several new video compression profiles, including something called uh, officially MPEG-4 Advanced Simple Profile, which is a little bit ridiculous. That's, I mean, sort of Orwellian. Uh, advanced Simple Profile. People ended up calling that MPEG-4 ASP to get rid of the cognitive dissonance there. Uh, and so the MPEG-4 ASP was, it became the inspiration for a lot of different video codecs, but one that I want to talk about because, again, I think it's relevant to the rise of video streaming and sort of personally relevant to me is that, uh, remember that the MPEG standards are these basically long documents describing a scheme. They didn't necessarily provide full reference implementations of all of the algorithms they, they used, or even the best implementation, even if a reference implementation was provided. It was up to individual implementers to write the code that implemented the standard. One company that decided to implement an MPEG-4 ASP compressor and decompressor was called DivX. And they wrote one that was all right. It was decent, and this was in the early 2000s. As was the spirit at the time, they decided at one point to make their source code open source in the hopes that the open source community would contribute to it, improve it, but that they could still make some money by uh, offering support. They, they could offer customers um, you know, help with, with setting it up and, and debugging assistance or whatever, uh, and that they could leverage this new higher quality code, open source code, for their own purposes. They did this and then very quickly changed their minds. They made their code open source, the open source community grabbed it and started developing it, and then the DivX people decided they'd rather it wasn't open source. They had some disagreements, I think, with the open source community, so they began developing it as a closed source product again. But the thing about open source licensing, one of the genius points about open source licensing is, once you've released your code under an open source license, you can stop developing the code in an open source setting, but you can't unlicense it. Anybody that was already using that code could continue using it. They could fork it and continue developing it. And so members of the community took took that open source DivX code and began developing a fully open source codec called, I mean, you can sort of see where this name comes from, XVID, which is just DivX backwards. Uh, and I think over time they did actually get rid of all the original DivX code that was there, but they used that as their starting point. And XVID lived on for a long time. It actually may still be in use today for all I know, although it probably isn't the best choice anymore. And it was around 2003, around the time XVID and DivX were, were coming of age, XVID I think came of age a little bit later than DivX, that I learned as, I guess, a teenager that it was possible to go on the internet. I learned about torrenting. I learned it was possible to go on the internet and like download episodes of TV shows or download like full um, theatrical films and things at relatively low sizes. So maybe for a TV sh an hour of TV or a 40 minute TV show, 300 megabytes, and for a half hour long one, 175 or 100, 200 megabytes, and for a full movie, maybe 700 megabytes, I don't have to fit on a CD. I could just download these things and watch them using BitTorrent as opposed to, you know, waiting until the show came on TV and watching it, which was annoying for a variety of reasons. I was a teenager at the time. One of the reasons was that my parents wouldn't pay for a cable subscription. So all the shows I, wa I wanted to watch were unavailable 
available to me. So I began downloading them, and I believe that that was where I developed my interest in compression schemes. This idea that because of video compression, this download was small enough that I could actually download and watch a pretty high quality TV show as opposed to actually watching it on TV. It was actually higher quality than I would have watched it on TV. And I think that is what sparked my eventual interest in studying compression in an academic sense. It also, of course, really upset the uh, motion picture and television industries, who, of course, began trying to file lawsuits against people and whatever. And as I said, I've got a lot of complicated opinions on whether or not they were in the right, but certainly they took notice of the fact that video compression was good enough um, to be able to transmit high-quality versions of programs to people over their domestic internet connections. And so I think that the advent of torrenting and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in the early 2000s and codecs, MPEG-4 ASP codecs like DivX and XVID, um, may well have led to the beginning of streaming as we know it, a video streaming that we now get through this huge plethora of streaming services that are becoming lower and lower quality um, over time uh, as of 2023. And the streaming services like Netflix that, that um, came of age in the late 2000s and early 2010s, um, in a way, sort of destroyed uh, the, the so-called piracy that they were fighting against because subscribing to one streaming service to look at everything was a lot more convenient than tracking down some way of torrenting all the movies and TV shows that you wanted to watch. Um, of course, because streaming services are now much more fragmented and they cost a lot more, it seems like there's been a rise in so-called piracy in the last few years because people have gotten fed up paying exorbitant costs for streaming services when, you know, they could just go download video files like they did 20 years ago. So I guess whatever, what goes around comes, ag comes around. Um, okay, so a different part of the MPEG-4 standard that actually came out a little bit later was called Advanced Video Coding, which is often abbreviated as MPEG-4 AVC. Uh, it was also standardized with a different standards organization under the name H264. So this is a standards organization that likes using numbers. Um, and so uh, it, it is regarded, and I'm, I'm going to qualify this very carefully, uh, H264, or MPEG-4 AVC, is generally regarded, even, as t even in 2023, as the current baseline standard for high-definition broadcast streaming and media-stored video. So media here meaning things like Blu-ray discs. It is true that there are tons of much more advanced video codecs that can do quite a bit more than H.264 can, because H.264 was standardized in the mid-2000s, so, so almost 20 years ago. It is true that there are plenty of much more recent video standards that are really good at encoding especially extremely high definition like 4K or 8K video, and yet H.264 MPEG-4 AVC I maintain is still the standard, the baseline for your average video encoding. I said earlier, though, that the video you're currently watching on YouTube is probably not encoded in H.264, so what am I getting at there? I think this goes back to the same logic as the deflate scheme is 30 years old, and yet people still use it everywhere. It's so ubiquitous that using it is a safe choice, and I think the same is true of H.264. It's still very widely used because encoders and decoders for it, which in many cases are hardware accelerated or entirely in hardware, are so ubiquitous. And in particular, high-definition broadcast video, a a set of standards that, um, of course, lags behind the cutting edge, um, did standardize H.264 as one of the codecs allowed for high-definition broadcast. And so it's still in extremely wide use. Because everybody has H.264 encoders and decoders, it's a safe choice if you want to encode or decode video. Um, various successors in the MPEG family to AVC, to H.264, are something called HEVC, which is about 10 years old, um, who's formal, which is formally called MPEG-H Part 2. So the MPEG people have been making their standard names more and more obtuse as time has gone by. MPEG-1 made a lot of sense. MPEG-2 made a lot of sense. The fact that MPEG-4 has all these weird sort of substandards is very confusing. And then they just gave up on numbers and began calling things letters, so MPEG-H. I don't know how they ran out of numbers. Uh, so MPEG-H Part 2 is something called HEVC, High Efficiency Video Coding, um, which has been reasonably widely adopted. And then there's this even newer standard called MPEG-I Part 3, okay, which is a versatile video coding, okay, ver as if the previous standards weren't versatile. So I think they're just running out of, of adjectives, I guess, for their names. Um, so 
HEVC has been pretty widely adopted, uh, and VVC, which is very new and therefore very computationally intensive, is in the process of being adopted. However, I, I have noticed that as these um, MPEG schemes roll along, a lot of um, the adoption seems to be much slower over time because the impact of patents seems to be more significant. So a lot of people that want to use video compression don't want to use HEVC because they're worried about the impact of patents. They don't want to pay royalties. And there's also um, apparently been some dispute over the people. So HEVC's patents are a collection of different patents for various parts of the algorithm owned by various different people or various different corporations, not people, unfortunately. Um, and uh, in the past, for some video compression schemes, even patented ones, there have been uh, licenses provided by patent holders saying, if you use this in a free product, it's, you don't have to pay royalties. You only have to pay royalties if you sell this. Or you only have to pay, ro pay royalties for the compressor. You know what? You can, you can give the decompressors away for free, but you must pay royalties on compression tools. For HEVC, there ha there's been a much more stringent, I, I guess, reaction to this. And so the HEVC patent holders don't necessarily want to provide an exception for free software. And that's meant that a lot of people don't want to invest in that. They don't want to use HEVC. And so there's been a lot more of a development of free video codecs over the last few years because it's become, maybe people have begun to see the patents surrounding the MPEG standards as a bit of a racket. They don't really want to get involved in that. They know that by developing MPEG-based schemes and paying the patents or paying the royalties, they are sort of legitimizing this practice. And so I've noticed, I guess, that there's been some attempt to shift away from MPEG standards recently to to not legitimize this constant use of patents. And the, the use, the way that software patents have been used over the past decades, whether they were considered legitimate to begin with or not, and I've got strong opinions on that too, believe me, whether or not software patents made sense in 1980, um, uh, it's certainly true that the way that they've been, that they've been exploited by corporations holding patents over the past 20 years has been pretty nasty. Okay, there's my rant about that. Um, so as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, a lot of these video compression schemes, because they're designed for stuff like broadcast video or decoding Blu-ray, uh, they're going to be implemented in hardware. So we'll develop special uh, dedicated processors or coprocessors just to do that. And even general purpose processors, like the CPU that you in your machine right now, may actually have extra logic for hardware acceleration of video compression. A, a lot of GPUs for a long time, sort of an extra feature of many GPUs for going back decades actually, has been a hard hardware acceleration of decoding and encoding of, of popular, um, uh, widely adopted video compression formats because it is very computationally intensive. I swear we're actually going to begin talking about the algorithms pretty quick here. Um, so, okay, uh, here's the patent thing showing up. So the MPEG standards have all this, these patent issues, and that means if, for example, you decide to found a startup, you, you finish this course, you graduate, you found a startup, and one of the, and the product you're, you're developing requires the use of streaming video, you might worry about needing to pay royalties on those patents. You might, if you use a certain streaming video implementation, you'll realize it might cost more because it's using a patented video compression scheme. And so it's good for everybody, it's good for all of business, for there to be royalty-free schemes. So there actually are a few royalty-free schemes that have gained widespread support. Um, Theora is one, although Theora is in a lot of ways more of a proof of concept that such a scheme can exist. Um, whereas AV1, which is a member of a family um, uh, that includes also the codec VP9, so AV1 is what would have been called VP10, but it was called AV1 instead to give it this sense of AV1 sounds like a very, um, uh, I guess, final standard, like the video codec, AV1, whereas VP9, VP10 sound like incremental improvements, which they are. Um, YouTube appears to use, uh, these days, a combination of VP9, H264, and AV1 for its encoding. I did a bit of reading about this. I, I read a few articles about it. It appears that YouTube decides which codec to use to encode videos based on how many views the video has. AV1 requires a lot more time to encode than VP9 or H.264. So that means that if a video isn't going to be viewed very many times, YouTube might want to use up, might not want to use very much encoding time, might not want to use much processing time to encode the video in AV1 for distribution. Once videos become very widely viewed, uh, apparently YouTube begins streaming them in AV1, whereas videos with no views, for example this video, are probably encoded using a codec that might have worse compression performance, but on the other hand requires less of YouTube's processing time to encode code. 
So among other royalty-free schemes are VP9 and AV1. Um, AV1 is maintained by a consortium, but I think the prime mover is considered to be Google. Um, and there are pl plenty of other video compression schemes that are either um, people have heard of them, but they're not in very wide use, or nobody's ever heard of them because they're proprietary. So um, this is less of the case now, but certainly in the past it was the case that there would be these streaming video compression schemes that nobody had ever heard of because they were only used inside of one closed source product. They were a proprietary format. So they're not formally standardized, and so we know very little about them. Um, okay, so one thing I will observe is that Almost all of widely used video compression schemes, besides one-off ones or experimental ones, as of 2023, use pretty much the same set of basic techniques. They use a bunch of advanced techniques as well that we're not going to get into, but most of them rely on techniques that we've actually already seen. So, for example, pretty much all of them use a block-based DCT or for some of them that want to be edgy and you know not necessarily do something too mainstream, they might, instead of using the DCT, which is too mainstream, they might use the discrete sine transform. Okay, but you get the idea. They use these block-based, um, wave-based transformations um, and uh, or, or sine or cosine-based transformations as part of their pipeline, just like JPEG. So we already know quite a bit about that. There are several formats um, that use different transformations. So one that's notable is VC2, which is also called Dirac, which was developed originally by researchers working for the BBC in Britain, um, in the United Kingdom, uh, which uses a wavelet-based method. So the discrete wavelet transform instead of the discrete cosine transform or discrete sine transform. That'd be a fun topic for like half of a course, but not today. Um, and so uh, we are going to talk about the broad set of techniques that have followed us all the way back from the MPEG-1 era. All the techniques I'm talking about today were provided to some extent by MPEG-1, although modern schemes uh, provide more flexibility with their use. They allow them to be used with, I guess, higher uh, computational um, uh, difficulty. Um, I want to also briefly talk about this, which is that one of the very complicated parts of video compression isn't the compression of the video stream itself. It's how do we fold together the video and the audio, or how do we package up the video stream in a way that it can be easily streamed? Um, that isn't trivial. Um, unlike the use cases of bit streams we've seen elsewhere in this course, like JPEG or like Deflate, um, streaming video isn't received all at once. I'm, I'm going to send you the stream over time. It could be over hours or days. So I have to find some way of packaging the data that you can receive it in discrete chunks such that you can do some decoding while you're waiting for the rest. That actually is non-trivial. It's especially non-trivial if you have to interleave audio and video and subtitles and other metadata. So I have to find some way of packaging up all the different parts of my streaming video, so audio, video, subtitles, such that you can receive it incrementally and decode it in apparently linear order. That isn't easy, and that's one reason why an assignment on streaming video is actually, I found, quite difficult to put together. For our assignment four, we're not going to use a formal container format because that would be quite a nightmare. It, it is quite difficult to learn how those things work. And that is a, a, a difficult problem to solve if you're developing um, video compression formats. So normally when you have a video stream, you package it into either what we call a container format for storage, so to store it in a file on disk, or maybe you'd call it a transport stream for streaming purposes. So to stream it over digital broadcast video or to stream it the way YouTube is streaming this video to you right now. Um, and so some container formats are designed for both, some are designed for only one of those two use cases. Container formats typically provide a mechanism for interleaving audio and video information that, that could be an one audio stream and one video stream, or it could be five audio streams and three video streams. So a very common use case is to have one video stream and then multiple audio streams for different languages. So if you watch a TV show that um, was originally recorded in English, it might be streamed with several other audio streams for that, have, that are dubbed versions for different languages languages, or it might come packaged up with subtitle information so that if it's recorded in a language other than English, and you like me, well, I mean, I sp the only languages I speak are like English C and C++ and stuff, um, but if I, and generally TV shows recorded in C++ aren't very exciting, unfortunately, they're still working on that, but um, if I watch a show recorded in a different language and I want to put subtitles on or listen to a dubbed audio track, the container format has to provide some way to multiplex that in with the video and, and um, the default audio channel. So some 
examples of container formats that we're not going to talk about much further are the various container formats used by MPEG video, and you might recognize these as the .mp4 or .m4v extensions for video streams. .m4a is for MPEG. It is a container format designed for MPEG audio. It is not the same as the .mp3 format, although maybe there are some similarities. There's also a container format called Matroska or .mkv. That is the container format that I am using right now to record this. So when I record my videos, this is the container format that gets used. It's an open format, which is why it's used very widely. It's also been used as the basis for a bunch of other formats. Uh, video formats like the .webm format are based on the Matroska container. There was also this container format used like a, a million years ago. So in the early 1990s, um, in early Windows, uh, like the, the primordial Windows media player of the early 1990s, provided a format called .avi. So that stood for Audio Video Interleave, which was a very uh, austere and esoteric format that by today's standards is pretty is a, a bit of a mess. Like it, it doesn't it doesn't do a lot of the things we expect of a container format these days, and it actually proved to be quite difficult to encode things like H.264 into AVI format. And yet, for some reason, the AVI format just refuses to die. It likely is still in use in some contexts. I have used, strangely, Linux-based video editing software recently that still wants to use the AVI format. So that's strange. Um, if I were to recommend a container format for your use for some future purpose, you might want to use .mp4 or .mkv. Um, since we do not want to talk more about container formats in this course, for our assignment four, we're not going to use a formal container format. I, I've come up with a way of designing the assignment such that all you have to worry about is a raw video bitstream. And we use a couple of um, well, well designed open source conversion programs. Uh, in particular, I guess I'll put a plug for this here. The FFmpeg project is really good at providing a video compression infrastructure. We're going to use that as a way of um, uh, encoding and decoding our video from a container format if we need to do so. So our compression program can work with basically raw video data. Um, so uh, in the event that we need a formal container format, so I have to choose Matroska or .mp4 or something, uh, it turns out the container format and the video codec can maybe fight with each other. So as I mentioned, when you're streaming video, you have to find a way of packaging up the frames of video so that the receiver can get them fast enough to decode as you are sending them. So, you know, you send a few frames and it shows them, then you send a few more frames. Um, the way a video format does this and a way a container format expects this could differ. And that's uh, one of the reasons why you have to maybe choose a container format that matches the working style of your video uh, compression format. Um, and that means that there are cases where a certain video format, like a video compression scheme, doesn't work with some container formats. That's just an aside point because we're not going to worry too much more about container formats. Okay, so what do we what do we do? Like, come on, it's been 50 minutes now. Can we actually do some video compression? Yes, let's. We'll talk about some of the techniques used in MPEG-1. Many of, the, of these techniques are still core techniques today, but they're used to a much greater scale. So uh, there are much more advanced algorithms that are much more computationally intensive for them. But they still have their genesis way back in MPEG-1 30 years ago. Um, the MPEG schemes were, uh, in a sense, just sort of a list of possible techniques, a standard list of techniques. Not every compressor would use all of these techniques or use them to their full extent, and maybe not every decompressor would support them either. Uh, and so that we, we saw that to a, some extent in the last lecture with JPEG, where JPEG supports a bunch of stuff that nobody ever used. JPEG supported arithmetic coding that nobody ever used. The modern MPEG formats support a variety of different really complicated arithmetic coding modes um, that we're not going to worry about. But these are examples of the fact that the MPEG standards are often running a bit ahead of technology. They'll talk about techniques that the standard supports, even if at the moment computers aren't fast enough uh, to use them or nobody's ever actually implemented algorithms to do those techniques. The idea is the MPEG standard is there to say, here are techniques you should develop that our compression scheme does officially support. So some of them, and the ones that we are going to focus on, are temporal compression. And that's the idea that we can sort of treat our set of frames as adding a third dimension to this 2D image, and therefore we could try and achieve compression by um, taking advantage of similarities from one frame to the next. Macro blocks, which is a way of um, I guess combining together some aspects of our images conveniently, so, so bundling a bunch of blocks of our images together so that compression is more convenient, and motion compensation, which is a way of refining the differential uh, encoding that we're going to try and achieve with temporal compression. So we'll start with temporal compression. 
Um, so the most basic video compression scheme, the one that I alluded to at the very beginning, would just encode each frame of video as a separate independent image. So frames are, are of course stored as standalone images. They can still be compressed internally. So that is, I can just take frame zero and frame one and, and compress them in a vacuum. Um, what I'm doing therefore is performing compression that relies only on data from inside the same image. And we're gonna call this intra-frame compression. It's compression inside of a frame, not compression between between frames. Nothing I use in this intra-frame compression that I'm using for frame one can rely on data from frame zero, just data from elsewhere in frame one. Um, so frames and, and every video compression format I've ever heard of supports choosing to store individual frames using intra-frame compression only, storing it independent of all other frames. Um, because these frames are stored using only intra-frame compression, we typically will call them iframes in the context of video compression. Um, in all major video formats that I've ever heard of, at least one frame in the stream must be an iframe. And in those formats, it has to be the first frame, although we can think of weird mathematical cases where it doesn't actually have to be the first frame, but we won't come, we'll, we'll think about those some other time. So when I talk about iframes, an iframe is a frame compressed as a single individual still image. And this is therefore not going to take advantage at all of the fact that, I, I don't know, frame two is probably very similar to frame one or frame three. Now, of course, doing this is not going to be good for bitrate because that means that we're encoding every frame separately. So every frame is going to suffer from some overhead because I can't take advantage of similarities between frames. There are cases where encoding video as a sequence of still images or with predominantly iframes can be a good idea. As we'll notice later, if you begin encoding frames that rely on information from previous frames, then if I want to join the stream right here before frame two, if I seek my stream, if I fast forward my video right to frame two, to decode frame two, I need to decode frame zero and frame one if frame two depends on those other frames. So in contexts where I want to constantly jump around inside my video, having iframes is quite helpful. If I jump to frame four and frame four is an iframe, to decode the stream starting at frame four, I can just start decoding frame four because frame four doesn't depend on any previous frames. If on the other hand, a bunch of my frames depend on previous frames, and that includes previous uh, non iframes, if I wanna jump right into frame number four here and frame three and frame two depend on previous frames, to fast forward to frame four, I have to decode all of the previous frames so I know how to decode frame four. And you can see how that might create some lag if I want to seek inside of my video. If you've ever noticed a long delay when you're seeking inside of a video, uh, let's assume it's a video you have on disk, not a YouTube video, because some of that delay could be network delay. Um, if you ever notice a long delay, that is because your machine might have to decode a whole bunch of previous frames to allow you to jump directly into a video. Um, so our general idea though is that we want to leverage some uh, similarities between frames. So the idea is since two consecutive frames of video will often have significant similarities, why don't we use delta compression? Why don't I encode my first frame from scratch and then every subsequent frame I can encode it by just taking its difference from the previous frame. So I use a delta. Um, I could even go further and use predictive delta encoding. So we've seen before that if we're gonna use delta compression and we have some idea about what differences we're going to see, so we know the previous frame uh, and the next frame are gonna have certain similarities, why not use predictive delta compression? It's not just delta compression, but prediction. Uh, and this is a form of what I'm gonna call temporal compression. It is compression leveraging the dimension of time. It allows uh, the data in one frame to be compressed using a prediction scheme based on the data in the previous frame. The most obvious prediction scheme would be to say, if I wanna know what the value of this pixel is, let's predict it'll be exactly the same as the value of the same pixel in the previous frame. Or we could synthesize it based on the other pixels surrounding it, as well as the, the other pixels surrounding it in the previous frame. But there's lots of different prediction mechanisms we, we can come up with, and they can be incredibly complicated. We'll, we'll see a few examples of them later in this lecture. Um, but of course, they've only become more complicated over time as we've developed more and more processing capacity. So because these use prediction, 
any frame that where any part of the frame relies on predicted delta values uh, based on the previous frame or other previous frames, it could be one previous frame, it could be two previous frames, or a thousand previous frames, any frame that relies on any form of predicted information, we are going to call a P frame for a predicted frame. So P frames are frames whose contents are entirely or in part compressed by using data from a previous frame, or actually we should say from previous frames. In MPEG-1, maybe we wouldn't allow that, but in modern schemes, we are allowed to have P frames that are computed using data from a lot of previous frames. Um, notice how a P frame can rely on a previous P frame or on a previous I frame. There's no requirement that P frames only rely on I frames. The idea is once you've decoded frame number two, you have a complete image. So then you can decode frame number three based on that complete image. It's true that frame number two is synthesized based on differential information, but that doesn't matter. By the time you actually have frame number two, you can use the complete image you end up with as the basis for frame number three. So in general, um, even though you are allowed in an MPEG style scheme and probably in the scheme you develop, you are allowed to have a, um, a frame that relies in, so some blocks of this frame can be encoded directly with intra-frame compression, but if the frame contains any blocks that are computed based on the values in a previous frame that are predicted, then the frame is called a P frame. So a P frame is allowed to contain bits and pieces that are encoded only as intra-frame compression. But if any block of the frame uses prediction from a previous frame, we call it a, pre a P frame. Um, okay, so in MPEG-1, the prediction only allowed one previous uh, decompressed frame. So a P frame had to use the previous frame only as input. Uh, modern schemes allow a, a mixture of previous and uh, older frames, as well as you could use two frames at once, you could use five frames at once, you could jump back a few frames. So in general, it's up to you. If you implement a scheme, you can do whatever you want. But in MPEG-1, so 30 years ago, back when computational power was much less than it is today, a P frame only used the previous decompressed frame as input. Um, so as I mentioned a minute ago, in block-based schemes like the MPEG family and like the scheme you are likely to develop in assignment four, a P frame is a frame where any blocks are predicted, not necessarily where every block is predicted. Certainly if you're making a P frame, you have an incentive to use prediction as, for as many blocks as you can. But if there are blocks that somehow don't benefit from prediction, you are allowed to use a non-predicted block to use an intra-block um, compression scheme. So just use a DCT and, and leave it there and compress the DCT absolutely. This is sort of similar to in deflate where deflate has those different modes. You can use block type two, you can use block type zero, or you can mix them together. Inside of a particular deflate bitstream, you can have any mixture of block types that you want. Inside a particular P frame, you can have any mixture of intra-block compression and predicted compression. Um, now, a general rule of thumb as far as the compression advantage you expect is that you should aim for P frames to require about 10% of the amount of space as an I frame, because we expect that similarities between frames should be significant, and therefore we should be able to achieve, even in the MPEG-1 context, 10%. In modern schemes, we should expect even better still, like way better. The advantage can be amplified substantially in a modern scheme. Uh, for assignment four, we're going to hold you to the MPEG-1 level, so you should definitely be able to get your P frames to 10% or hopefully significantly less than that on assignment four. Now, wait a minute, why should I only be allowed to use the previous frame? I mean, certainly if time goes this way, it does make sense that I encode frame three based on frame two. But on the other hand, isn't it true that maybe if frame one and frame four are part of a gradual transition between frames, so the camera is moving gradually, or the image is fading, or the light is changing gradually, isn't it true that really frame two and frame three could be written as a product of both frame one and frame four? Why can't we predict the value of a block inside our frame based both on previous frames and on frames in the future to some limited extent? Obviously, if we go too far in the future, it's going to be very hard to decode this. But shouldn't I be allowed to use future frames as a point of reference if it improves my compression advantage? And the answer, going all the way back to MPEG-1, is yes. So here's a justification for why I might want that. Consider these three frames here. Suppose I want to encode frame one using some kind of prediction. Notice that it seems like what's happening is uh, the pair is sort of, sort of fading to black, which means frame one might be exactly halfway between frame zero and frame two. If I'm allowed to predict the value of frame one based on a linear combination of frame zero and frame two, I might get pretty good mileage out of that. So if I'm allowed to use 
both past and future frames, I might be able to accurately predict those pixels and get a huge compression boost. Uh, and so that brings us to a bi-directionally predicted frame. That's a frame that's allowed to use both past and future information. We call these B frames per, for short. And as far as the ecosystem we care about for assignment three or assignment four and for this lecture, that brings us to the complete set. I frames, P frames, and B frames. So a B frame is allowed to contain a standalone block, so an intra-block compressed block, a, a block that's predicted based on the previous I or P frame only, or predicted based on both the next P frame and the previous uh, I or P frame. Um, so in a B frame, you can have blocks that rely on only themselves, so intra-blocks. You can have blocks that rely only on the previous frame, just like P frames can, or you can have blocks that rely on both past and future frames. You'll notice that I've qualified it by saying it has to be the next I or P frame or the previous I or P frame. That's to avoid some kind of circular logic. We can't have a situation like this. So we can't allow B frames to rely on each other, at least in the MPEG context, because that would open the door to something funny happening like a B frame that relies indirectly on itself, a circular dependency. So to get around that, we just uh, bar any B frame from relying on a B frame. So B frames can be predicted based on values from previous I or P frames uh, or future uh, I or P frames, but not other B frames. That's a constraint of MPEG. Uh, you could design a scheme that doesn't have that constraint. We're going to work with that constraint for now because I think it, it's a good way to clear our minds, I guess. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, MPEG-1 puts pretty strict um, uh, constraints on this, but modern schemes, so for example H.264 or AVC as it's also called, allow B frames to use information from multiple previous or future frames. So whereas in MPEG-1, frame number 4, a B frame, would be allowed to rely on both frame 3 and fr frame 5, so the most recent um, P or I frame and the next P or I frame. In AVC or H.264, you could also have um, frame four rely on frames uh, zero and frame six. You could have it rely on some combination of those. Keeping in mind that if you can leverage that combination as a good predictor, you might be able to get a compression advantage. You, it would require more time for compression to go find all of those similarities, but why not? If we've got lots of processor time, why not use it? We want to save as much space as we can. So as I said, for our purposes, to avoid circular dependencies, although you, can, you don't have to implement this requirement in your scheme, if we talk about this uh, B frames in this lecture or on an exam, we're going to assume B frames can only depend on I or P frames. They cannot use information from other B frames to avoid the general problem of circular dependencies, a frame depending indirectly on itself. Um, you could always identify circular dependencies with a graph traversal, but video compression people don't really have the time for that. Um, so, of course, this brings us to a problem, which is that I can no longer decode my stream in linear order. If I go back to the case where I only had P frames, so that would be this, then I can just walk through my frames from left to right and decode them. If I, I, get, I decode frames 0, I decode frame 1. If I want frame 2, well, I already have frame 1, so it's easy to reconstruct frame 2 based on frame 1. If I want frame 3, I have frame 2, and so on. It's easy to decode them from left to right. But that's not so um, with B frames. Frames. If, I want, if I'm walking from left to right, well, okay, I can definitely decode frame zero, but how do I decode frame one? Or frame two, actually, for that matter. I'm not allowed to decode frames one or two until I receive frame three, which is a bit of a problem. And, and you can see here that this means that B frames should be used with care. B frames are a powerful technique, but I have to be careful to make sure that I don't have the B frame um, develop a dependency on something so far in the future that I won't be able to decode my video. If I'm streaming video, maybe I'm able to wait a little bit longer until I get done decoding frame three before I decode frame one or frame two. But that's going to make my, that's going to delay my signal a bit. Um, I don't want to wait too long. So I want to make sure that B frames don't depend on something too far into the future. I also probably want to transmit my frames out of order. Because you can't decode frame one until you've seen frame zero and frame three, I'll probably send you frame zero and frame three before I send you frame one. And then it's your responsibility to decode frame zero, to decode frame three, to decode frame one, and then frame two, and then put them back into order before playing them back. Because the viewer, of course, needs to see them in numerical order. But I'll send them to you out of order so that you can get started 
started on the decompression faster. You can decode frame three while you're waiting for frame one to come in, and then you can decode frame one right off the bat. Instead of this option where you have to wait for me to send you frame three before you can even start decoding frame one that you're currently sitting on. Like you've already received the data for frame one, but you can't decode it until you get here. So it makes sense to send it out of order. Then we have to be careful to choose a good ordering of frames such that you're able to decode things as fast as possible. I like sending it in this order because I can decode frame three while I'm waiting to receive frame one and frame two. Then when I decode frame one, I can play back frame one and then frame two and then frame three. Um, there are lots of orders I could use though. I could send them in this order. Um, I could even, even send them in an order like this. If I send them in this order here, frame one is coming in um, after frame five, which means I have to have encoded frame five before I send it. That's a problem. But also notice how I am not going to need frame five until here at the earliest. I need frame five before I can decode frame four, but I don't need frame five for frame one or frame two. So if I send you frame five first, I'm wasting your time. You don't need frame five just yet, but frames one and two are pretty urgent. So notice how choosing an order is not trivial, although it's pretty easy to develop a heuristic that chooses the order in a sensible way. Generally speaking, you shouldn't be sending frame five until you've sent all frames that don't depend on frame five. So frames one and frame two. And so it's pretty easy to develop an ordering, but notice that the order isn't completely trivial. Um, I could also transmit, and if we you know, extrapolate this outwards, I could come up with all sorts of completely absurd orderings. I could transmit iframe number six that nobody needs long before anybody, uh, anybody will want to display it. So iframe six is only benefit, I only need iframe six to display to the user. I don't need it to reconstruct any of the other frames. So I could send it really early, but that would be sort of dumb because then I would, I would waste some bandwidth and some time, because remember time is of the essence here, sending a frame way before you otherwise need it. Whereas meanwhile, you really need frames three, one, and two, and my delay has meant that it's gonna, be, gonna become harder for you to decode those in time. So therefore, if you wanna support B frames, you have to maintain a buffer of frames. You have to have be encoding a few frames ahead um, so that you can keep track of all the frames you have on hand and then use them to uh, construct the B frames. Uh, that's why if you implement B frames on assignment four, you'll get some extra marks because it is not trivial, even though it's a really powerful uh, a compression technique and therefore worth doing. So you have to buffer your frames, uh, encode a few frames ahead, and then choose some frames to become B frames and then send the frames out of order so they can be easily decoded. Um, and so in, in general, if we have a, a scheme that follows the MPEG-1 style where B frames can only rely on one previous frame and one future frame, you don't need to have that big of a buffer. You just have to save the two most recently transmitted I or P frames at each point. Um, so that, because if you receive them out of order, uh, the decompressor would be storing frame zero and frame three with the understanding that the compressor knows not to send it anything that depends on any other frames until after it's sent frame, let's say frame five. So you can arrange the decompressor doesn't have to have that many frames saved up. Assuming, of course, that the decompressor uh, decompresses stuff as quickly as it can and it de decompresses every frame it receives as early as it possibly can. So if the frames are received in the order above, every frame uh, received before frame three um, can be uh, deleted when frame five gets there. So notice that I need frame zero while I'm decoding. So at this step, after I receive frame three, I've got two non-B frames saved up. I need frame zero as long as I'm decoding the next two B frames. But if we agree that you're going to always send the frames in this sensible order, then when you send me P frame five, I will know that all of the frames that are coming next will depend on P frame three and P frame five only. They can't depend on frame zero because I've already used up all the frames that depend on frame zero as of that point. So you can develop an ordering that you can um, share between both compressor and decompressor that ensures you don't need to keep too many frames saved up in the decompressor. Um, so, okay, uh, to ensure, among other things, that decompression does not get arbitrarily delayed, most schemes will place a limit on the maximum number of consecutive B frames. Now, this is contrast to P frames, where even in MPEG-1, you can have lots of P frames in a row. You might not want to, but you're allowed to. In uh, most schemes, you're not allowed to have that many B frames in a row. There is some limit. Although the limit can be very large in modern schemes, there is a limit because we need to give the decompressor a bit of slack. We need to give the decompressor a, a chance to be able to 
decode things in, in sufficient time to play them back. The more distance you have between, uh, um, the more span you have of B frames, the more distance there are between I or P frames between each other, the harder it is to decode things in time. If I have this many B frames between two P frames or between two I frames, I can't display this B frame until I've decoded these two P frames. And that means I have to both encode those P frames, send them to you, and send you this B frame in time. And that, of course, can be a bit of a, that can be a bit of a problem. Because as the compressor, you might not even have this P frame until you've already seen all of these other frames. It might take a while to get it because you might be receiving the frames from a live source. So, of course, having a limit on the number of consecutive B frames can be quite helpful. And I would suggest you set such a limit yourself. Maybe start with a limit of one or two or three. Um, now, I want to talk about the expected compression you get from B frames. It's tough because due to all of the other influences of bit rates and perceptual factors and other things, and the algorithms used to actually create this differential compression, it's hard to have some law, to state some law, or to derive something ourselves for how small frames should be. So I, I went through and I looked at various sources for what how big they think B frames should be. And it was sort of infuriating because it appears as if there is a, a consensus, some convention that everybody has adopted, that on average in the MPEG-1 context, at least. So certainly it'll be way less than this for like AVC or H265 or something. Um, or, or sorry, AVC, H264 is called AVC. H265 is HEVC. For modern schemes, this rule of thumb is certainly a bit obsolete. Um, but for the MPEG-1 context, it appears as if everybody follows a rule of thumb where in an iframe, um, we should have about one bit per pixel in an iframe. In a P frame, it should be about 10% of that size. So 0 0.1 bits per pixel. And in a B frame, it should be 0 0.015 bits per pixel. So in other words, a P frame is 10% of an I frame. A B frame is about 15% of a P frame. And so maybe if this rule of thumb is reasonable, and I think it is, that shows us that B frames are a big deal. The more of them I can use, the better of a compression. I can really ratchet up my compression advantage by using lots of B frames. So what's infuriating about this is it appears by, by reading various sources that everybody in the compression community, the, the video experts, seem to think that this is a good rule of thumb. Thumb. But nobody was able to tell me where this rule of thumb came from. So there actually are published papers. So here is an example of a published paper, not one that proposes the rule, but one that invokes the rule. It says, we think we're using the rule of thumb that uh, I frames are one bit per pixel, P frames are 0 0.1, B frames are 0 0.015. They don't explain where they got that rule from, but it's clear from the way that they use it that it's, wi that it's widely used. So it's a widespread rule of thumb. And I don't know, these authors are video experts and so are the MPEG people. So we will adopt this, even though it's frustrating that I can't figure out who, who made it up, where they got it from. Um, so I want to talk now about how the prediction is actually done. So we know about the three types of frames. For I frames and, or for P frames and B frames, we have to talk now about how we do the prediction. And we know already that we can come up with very basic prediction techniques. So we'll, we'll start with that. So let's denote, I, I need to talk about the values of particular pixels in particular frames. I'm gonna use this notation for lack of any better idea. So VXY to the power of I. So that's gonna be pixel XY, so X coordinate first, Y coordinate second, in frame I. The superscript will be the frame number. It's where we are in time. So in the most basic version of a P frame, if frame I is a P frame, I could encode every pixel in frame I as a delta value. So delta XY is just the value of the pixel in the current frame minus the value in the previous frame. Whether the previous frame was a P frame or an I frame, I don't really care. Um, and so th the idea though is the previous frame here is going to be an I frame or P frame. We won't worry about the B frame impact yet because we know that P frames can't depend on B frames. Um, so anyway, I just compute the basic delta of pixel for pixel. And then if the decompressor wants to reconstruct it, it could just add the original value um, uh, of vi minus one xy back in. Now there is one thing I'm going to I'm going to need to clarify in a few, in a couple of minutes here about what I mean by um, uh, how I compute the difference in the compressor. Uh, but I'll come back to that in a second. So if I'm using a DCT-based scheme, uh, the, the MPEG-1 scheme and MPEG schemes are generally block-based DCT schemes, and they use 8x8 blocks, although more modern schemes might use 16x16 16 or 32x32 32 blocks. But in any event, you use some block. We'll just say it's 8x8 like JPEG does. If I want to encode an iframe, I would follow the following process. I would first in, uh, divide the image up into 8x8 blocks, um, then compute the DCT, quantize it, round it off, just like in JPEG. So we already know how to do this. You're probably 
going to recycle your assignment 3 logic directly for this purpose. I then um, store the resulting sequence using deltas and entropy coding the same way I would in JPEG or in assignment. Well, I guess assignment 3 wouldn't require that, but you'll probably want to do that. And then um, I, in the compressor, I decompress the current frame from what I compressed. So I know I have the original frame, obviously, because I'm the compressor, but I then decompress what I just produced, and I used that decompressed result for any future P or B frames. So for the purpose of computing this delta here, <clears throat> if I want to compute the delta for frame I based on frame I minus one, I wouldn't use the original image for frame I minus one as my point of reference. I would use the decompressed version of the compressed version of frame I minus one. Um, and the reason for this is because we have to think about what does the decompressor have access to? In a lossless setting, we never had to deal with this problem because we knew the decompressor could losslessly recover all of the information I had sent it. But that's not the case here. So for the sake of making sure that the deltas I'm computing are based on data the decompressor actually has, I'm going to decompress all of the frames I compress in the compressor so that I can use those as the basis for delta compression. Um, Okay, so and then I'll, I'll talk, I'll, I'll show an example of why I need to do that in a second. Um, if I want to uh, uh, encode a P frame, I might do something like this. Um, one key thing to understand though is that when I encode a P frame, I'm computing delta values. Those delta values should be computed before I compute the DCT. So I'm actually going to compute the DCT based on the uh, delta values for the block, not based on the original pixel values. So my pipeline would be divide the image into blocks inside of each predicted block, and not every block is a predicted block. Maybe some of my blocks are encoded like iframes, but inside of predicted blocks, I subtract the value of each pixel in the previous decompressed frame from the values in that block in the current frame. Then I take the set of delta values and I run it through the DCT quantization and rounding process, and then I store the resulting integer sequence with delta compression and entropy coding as before. Um, as I mentioned a few times in this video, most schemes, including MPEG-1 and probably your scheme, should not require that every single block in a P frame be predicted, although it could be. Um, you are allowed to encode some blocks as standalone blocks, like in an iframe. So it's up, it's up to the compressor to choose which thing to do, so it'll probably make a choice based on which thing gives it a better compression advantage. Now remember, uh, when I compute those deltas, they're based on the previous decompressed frame, not the original input version of the previous frame, because that might disagree slightly with what the decompressor ends up with. So I can explain that via an ex a quick example. So suppose that this is frame zero. I'm going to use floating point data for this, but I, I don't have to. Uh, this will I hopefully prove the point one way or the other. Suppose I use this quantization matrix. Um, okay, so there's frame zero, there's the quantization matrix, there's the quantized frame, and here's the result of decompressing. So I multiply by the quantizers and then I, and then I, I, I recover frame zero. This is, this is, um, so, so yeah, this is the result of, uh, of performing decompression. Okay, so there's frame zero, there's the decompressed version of frame zero. Now it actually doesn't make much of a difference like e exactly how I do the compression here. So whether or not this was DCT or, or some other compression scheme, the, the point is sort of the same either way. The issue is the decompressed version of frame zero and the input of frame zero are going to be different. Maybe the differences are small, but they're going to be different. Um, so my decompressed version of frame zero is this. I should expect as the compressor that the decompressor ends up with this data, but not this data. So all the decompressor knows about frame zero is this thing. Okay, so now suppose I want to compress frame one. Okay, I quantize, um, and the question is, how do I use delta compression to encode the, the quantized result for frame one? Well, I could take the difference of, the, of um, frame one and frame zero directly. So I could just subtract um, frame one minus frame zero. There are my differences. There's my quantization matrix. I quantize the differences. Um, I decompress by, uh, in the decompressor, reversing the quantization. And then I can think of the error in the decompressed version from the original frame. If I subtract the data for frame one from the original data for frame zero in the compressor. Keeping in mind, the decompressor doesn't have the original data for frame 
and zero. These are the errors that I get, which aren't that bad. This is a respectable number, uh, error value for lossy compression. So this is one way to do it, and it turns out this is a bad way because it expects the decompressor to do something that's impossible. The decompressor can't recover this delta properly because the decompressor doesn't have one of the inputs. It doesn't actually have the original data for frame zero. So that's a problem. So what we could do easily to remedy this is have the compressor use a different point of reference. Instead of subtracting this from frame one, why don't I subtract the um, decompressed version of frame zero? The decompressor will have this. So I'll subtract um, this thing from frame one to compute my delta values. That way, when the decompressor wants to undo the delta compression, the decompressor just adds this back in. And the decompressor actually has this. So if I do that, if I compute frame one minus frame zero using this as my frame zero representation, then when I decompress it, I end up with this. And the error is now, as you can see, smaller. Now that's an anecdotal example, but I think maybe you can see the point. If I use the decompressed version of my frame as the point of reference, the decompressor can actually then recover it fully because the decompressor also has the decompressed version of my frame. It does not have the original version of my frame. That's why it's really important for this predicted uh, encoding to always decompress your frame in the compressor and use that as your point of reference, not the original input frame. Now this requires that the compressor decompress every frame right after it's done compressing it, which means that I have to use a bunch of computation time to uh, match up my state with the decompressor. But on the other hand, in compression, we're expecting the compressor to need to take more time than the decompressor, so that's not that big of a deal. That's just extra time. It isn't that much extra time either. Decompression in this sort of scheme is usually pretty fast. Um, okay, so that's one thing. So that's how we do the predictive encoding. We come up with some way of computing deltas. It could be as simple as our simple um, uh, definition from a few slides ago, uh, but we know that there are lots of other more complicated prediction techniques. I could use a bunch of other pixels, like neighboring pixels or something. There are lots of prediction techniques. We talked about this in lecture six. So if you want to employ them on assignment four, there are lots of things to think about and lots of ways to go with that. Okay, so what about um, other ways to optimize prediction besides just, in, I don't know, instead of predicting based only on the value of the current pixel, I could predict based on neighboring values like I just said, like we talked about in lecture six. Are there any specific facets of video itself that I could leverage to improve the accuracy of my predictions? And one option is to do what's called motion compensation, which is I don't know, like it's a good name for this technique, but in some ways the name can sort of fool you. Um, so let's consider this sequence of three frames. Um, so let's suppose that frame zero is an iframe, and I want to encode frame one and frame two as P frames. Also notice, if, like, if we take a look at the, the size of the pair here, you'll notice that it looks as if what's happening between frame zero and frame two is gradual movement. Although it's not that gradual. 30 frames per second, this would be incredibly fast movement. But you can see the idea. What I have are three frames that are very similar data, but it's been shifted because I guess the camera is moving or something. I'm slowly moving across um, some area of space. So I'm seeing very similar pixels at each step, maybe not identical pixels at each step, but similar pixels. Um, it's just that they're being displaced in space. So um, th the sequence shows movement, but it's still true that even though if I look at a particular pixel um, in frame uh, zero or frame, let's do, this, let's do this little block of frame one. If I find the equivalent thing in frame zero, it's sort of this. And, and you can see that, of course, that doesn't mean it's a perfect match for the contents of that block in frame one. If I do delta compression, I won't get a lot of zero deltas. Um, but on the other hand, there is a lot of similarity. So I can still, I mean, even if I have no compensation, P frames still provide a lot of benefits here because some of this block <clears throat> is the sort of pair color that it is over in frame zero. So even without any additional compensation, P frames would still help me, but I could really boost the advantage by doing something to account for the fact that the image as a whole has displayed global movement or even that parts of the image are displaying movement. So let's talk about one particular block inside of the image. <clears throat> so what I've highlighted here is the same group of pixels in all three images. 
And you'll notice that the same group in frame zero has completely different contents than the same group of pixels in frame two. So the question here is, if I'm deciding, if I've decided to, to um, represent, let's say, frame two using a predicted representation, and I use the same pixels in frame one as the basis for that, I might not get the best results. There are some things that are the same, or at least similar. That is, this area and this area aren't too different. This bright background area is present in both, but certainly this lower third of the image is, is or lower third of the block is different in both. Um, so because of the movement, if I just do direct predictions between frames, I might lose some of my compression advantage because although a lot of the same data is there, it's not in the same place. And so the solution, I think, is maybe when I go to predict this block in frame two, I should be allowed to use as the basis for my prediction a slightly different place in frame one. Notice that if I can figure out what movement is going on, I can find the exact same group of pixels, the exact same block in all three images. It's just been moved around a little bit. So if I am allowed to um, compute my deltas using some kind of spatial offset, You'll, you'll hopefully agree, the deltas I compute between this block and this one might all be zero or really close to zero. I could round them to zero and probably not see a quality loss. That's a huge deal, the ability to compensate for motion or motion compensation. So even though the block, the, the version of that block, the displaced block in frame two or frame one and frame zero might have some small differences. We're doing delta compression here. So I don't care about small differences. I love small differences. I want to avoid large differences. So certainly the ability to choose where I'm getting my point of reference can really help me for compression purposes. So these are examples of motion compensation techniques. Um, and typically, because although there are lots of ways of compensating for motion, we need one that is computationally relatively easy, especially for the decompressor. And one really easy way is to say, okay, I'm predicting the contents of this block in frame number two. When it comes time to do the prediction, I would like you to take your predictions from this slightly shifted block in frame number one. And I can describe the shift by means of a vector. We'll call that vector a motion vector V. Really what I'm doing is I'm saying, when I compute my deltas, how far do I displace the delta, the block in space in the previous frame? So that displacement can be represented by the motion vector V. Um, and so for each, for each block in frame i, the motion vector represents the displacement between that block and the best match for that block in the previous frame or the previous p frame. So in frame i minus one or whatever previous frame you happen to be using. Um, and so if I define motion vectors for every single block, which does make sense for certain reasons. So one reason I might want to do that, as opposed to defining one motion vector for the entire image, is that I could be working with images where only part of the image is moving. So maybe the pair is moving across the frame, moving across the foreground. So motion can be different depending on where I am in the image. So it makes some sense to define motion vectors at the block level or as we'll see in a few minutes, the macro block level. Um, so when I define a motion vector, then when I go to compute my deltas, if I use the very simple delta computation from earlier, the delta value would be the value of the pixel in the current frame minus the value in the previous frame of the pixel with the same x, y coordinates, but shifted by my vector v, x, v, y. Um, so if I use, a, uh, if I give each block its own motion vector, um, that's useful because different blocks can exhibit different forms of motion, but it's also true that there is generally some correlation between the motion vectors of adjacent blocks. So if I've, if I've got a whole bunch of different blocks that I'm all, that I'm using prediction for, it's pretty likely if all these blocks are next to each other, let's give them all, let's try this sort of flat motion vector here. If this block has a motion vector that's sort of flat like this, it's pretty likely that the motion vector for the next block is pretty similar. It may not be identical, but it's going to be pretty similar. So one easy way of storing all of the motion vectors for the various blocks in the image is to store them all together in a row. So you store all the motion vectors before you store the block data. And when you store all the motion vectors in a row, you could store the motion vectors using delta compression based on the other nearby motion vectors, uh, because they're all likely to be pretty similar to each other. So that way, that, in other words, if I've got two blocks v1 and v2 and they've got motion vectors v1 and v2, I might encode v2 just by its difference from v1 because it's likely to be very similar. 
Um, now, I want to talk more about what motion compensation really means to us. Um, let's suppose we've got these two frames here. I've got an I frame followed by a P frame. And I want to use anything I can in frame zero to predict frame one. Okay, first observation. It doesn't appear as if there is motion between these two frames. They look completely different. I mean, they look like they have the same subject, but if there was motion, it was very fast motion. I'm not seeing a gradual motion like I was in the previous case. Can I still use motion compensation? Um, so, I mean, suppose I have this block and I want to choose a motion vector. What's a good choice? You'll observe that there is no part of the previous image that represents um, this upper edge of this particular piece of kiwi because that piece of kiwi isn't in the previous image. So what do I choose as my motion vector? Well, although we're calling this motion compensation, really this is just a technique to produce small delta values. The best choice for motion vector is any motion vector that gives me small delta values. I don't actually care whether it depicts something that is um, semantically similar to a piece of kiwi. I just care that I get small delta values. Um, so these two frames don't correspond to motion in the usual sense um, because they seem to depict different scenes or maybe the result of extremely fast motion across a scene. But a motion vector is still helpful because I can use a motion vector to get small delta values. For example, if I choose this block in my first frame, well, that's obviously not the same as the block in the second frame, but it looks very similar. It's got a sort of greenish region in the lower corner with some seeds, although it has a few more seeds. Um, the upper bit has some dark darkish area, so that might be a decent match. Not a perfect match, but a decent match, a match that might reduce my delta values. And if my delta values are small, then I get good compression. Um, and so really, um, the ideal motion vector isn't necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily match up exactly with the amount of motion. It's just any vector um, that um, is the optimal displacement for the purposes of delta compression. Any vector that gives us small delta values. It doesn't make any difference if it corresponds to legitimate motion or not. We don't need to think about the video at that level of detail. All we care about is small deltas. Um, and so in some cases, uh, even with delta compression and motion vectors and stuff, it isn't helpful to use I-frames or, or to use P-frames. In some cases, no matter what we do, even with the best motion vectors, the differences between the current frame and the previous one are too significant. And in that case, maybe it makes more sense just to use an I-frame to avoid all the extra machinery of a P-frame and just generate an I-frame and start your sequence of deltas again from scratch. Um, and that's one of the reason for that is that um, if you go looking for motion vectors, that can be quite difficult. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, it can require a lot of time and still not be perfect. Um, whereas encoding an iframe is usually pretty fast because iframes depend only on themselves. You encode them sort of like JPEG images. Uh, I want to talk about I want to talk about how we search for motion vectors, but in the meantime, I want to talk about this issue of uh, block-based compression and how we want to maybe speed that up a bit. So if I divide my image into eight by eight blocks and I go looking for motion vectors for all of them, that's going to be a pretty complicated search. But maybe I, I'm willing to spend the time. The issue is I've got this image that has three color planes. So I've got Y, and then if I'm doing subsampling, I've got CB and CR that are smaller. So if I do 420 subsampling then C, B, and C, R have one quarter the total number of pixels as Y. So here's the problem with that. If I go looking for motion vectors, so I look at this block in the top corner of Y. Well, this block in the top corner of Y corresponds to a much smaller block of pixels, a much smaller number of pixels in the top corner of C, B, and C, R. I certainly don't want to have to find the motion vectors separately for Y, C, B, and C, R because it's pretty much like, I mean, I would say 99% chance the motion vector is the same for the Y block, the CB block, and the CR block because the pixels either moved or they didn't. It's pretty weird, it's possible, but pretty weird to have a case where on the luminance plane you get one motion vector and on the color planes you get two completely different motion vectors. That's unlikely. It's pretty likely, therefore, that I'm going to have the same motion vector for the same part of the image no matter which color plane I'm looking at. So it makes sense that instead of finding motion vectors for every block of every plane, I might want to find motion vectors for every area of the image and then use those motion vectors separately on every color plane. That's, that's easier said than done because the size of the blocks is different. A block on the Y plane that's 8 by 8 corresponds to a, a 64 pixels of the image of the input image. 
But on the other hand, a block, an eight by eight block of input pixels corresponds to a four by four block of CB and CR pixels because they've been scaled down. So since operations like motion compensation wanna work on the whole block, if I, if I have different resolutions, that can be sort of a headache and that can make things complicated. So one thing, one easy way of working around that would be to say, how about we pair, we group blocks together spatially. So I've got, if I look at one eight by eight Y block, um, then that corresponds to a four by four CB block and a four by four CR block. Um, so uh, what I could do is group things together into larger units for the sake of uh, motion compensation and other operations. And we'll call these things macro blocks. A typical macro block, although you can decide what size you want to use, might contain um, four Y blocks. So there's, there's one Y block, there's another, there's another, there's another. So it's 16 by 16 pixels. And that corresponds to one eight by eight block for CB and CR. So each macro block is four Y blocks and one CB block and one CR block all bundled together. And you can see why I need to have four Y blocks. Because if I look at one eight by eight Y block, that's a four by four region of CB and CR. But I'm probably still using eight by eight blocks in CB and CR, so I can't easily deal with four by four areas of the C, B, and C, R plane. I want to work with complete blocks. And the idea behind a macro block is I'll just bunch together my Y blocks to make them big enough to fit inside of one C, B block or one C, R block. And then for this big macro block, I will then compute one motion vector. And that applies across all three color planes. Um, it turns out that other aspects, like whether to use intracoding or predictive coding or B-frame coding, might also be determined on a macro block level as well, because that's a good way of just applying the same technique to a group of spatially local blocks without having to break it down into smaller fragments, um, like you'd have to do if, if, if you use four by four sections or something. It allows you to keep using eight by eight blocks on each color plane, but for administrative purposes, have an easier filing system, I guess. Okay, so that's one thing. We'll just leave that there with, with macro blocks. But keep in mind that typical motion vector computations will use macro blocks and not individual blocks on individual color planes. Okay, now let's talk about how we search for motion vectors. I'm going to cover this at a very high level, just, so, just to give you a taste of various options. Suppose I want the best possible motion vector for a particular block of pixels. It's B by B. Now, before we can really talk about search techniques, I have to decide what it means to be the best. And that's complicated. Because remember that we don't actually care that much about finding the real motion in the frame. I just want whatever motion vector produces the best set of deltas. OK, but really my requirement, I mean, at the end of the day, I want to minimize the storage requirement of the block. So I want small deltas, but what does that even mean? I mean, if all the deltas are zero, that's certainly the best case. But do small deltas mean that the deltas are on average as small as possible, like the average value is small, or that the biggest delta is as small as possible, or that some measurement of error is as small as possible? I don't know, because it depends on how I'm encoding the delta values. If I encode deltas in such a way that a delta of plus one is like 10 times smaller than a delta of plus two, that's going to change what I consider to be a good motion vector compared to a scheme where a delta of plus one is 90% um, of the size of a delta of plus two. So you can see how the choice of the best motion vector comes down to what gives me the smallest block, not just what gives me the smallest set of deltas, because there are going to be a bunch of delta values, and their interactions with each other can have an effect on how big the block is. <sighs> okay, that means we have to define what it means for a motion vector to be the best before we can go looking for the best. And the best I can do with that is give you some ideas because it does come down to your choice of how you're storing the delta values, how you're encoding them. So here are three measurements, three numbers you could compute that minimize certain quantities that you could use as a point of reference for small delta values. You could compute um, the, ab the average absolute difference. In other words, I would like the average delta value to be as small as possible. So for a given motion vector V, if you're working with a particular block, you just go and compute the absolute value of the difference between the block's pixels and the pixels in the corresponding shifted block of the previous image. So the notation I'm using here is um, my vector, my, my potential motion vector is V. B is my current block, um, and its pixels go from 0 up to B minus 1 in both dimensions. And then PXY will be absolute coordinates of pixels in the previous frame. So I can therefore shift those coordinates by, um, 
using vx and vy against the block coordinates i and j. So I could compute, if I, if I uh, care about the average value of my deltas being as small as possible, I would probably use the average absolute difference. On the other hand, if I'm working with a delta encoding where large delta values are prohibitively expensive, maybe what I want to minimize isn't the average delta value. I want to make sure that the largest delta value is as small as possible. Here what I would do is I would just minimize the maximum delta value. Um, um, and so I want to minimize, it's strange, but I want to minimize the value of MAD here. So I go and find the maximum delta value. I want the resulting maximum to be as small as possible. So I'm minimizing a maximum. Or I could try and, this isn't really splitting the difference, but there are lots of other measurements I could use, such as the mean squared difference. Um, that is sort of leaning, of course, in a mean squared difference, large values have a larger contribution. So the mean squared difference, in a sense, compromises between these two measurements. But hopefully you can see that it comes down to how your deltas get encoded. And although if you implement this, you're not going to necessarily want to analyze which of these formulas better reflects your delta encoding, what you could easily do is implement implement some delta encoding and then implement uh, motion compensation and just try all three of these measurements as your measurement of whether a, a particular vector is good or not and see which one produces the best result because it will depend on how you measure and therefore which delta which uh, motion vector you choose so suppose that we've decided what it means to be a good motion vector. We've chosen one metric among these or among some other set of metrics. We've decided what it means for a vector to be good. How do I find it? I want to go search through the image and find a good motion vector. It's going to be computationally expensive. Our images might be very large, and searching might require almost an exhaustive search. Um, one thing to observe is that this is only a compressor problem. Once you have the motion vector, recovering the delta values is very easy. I just have to use the motion vector to index into the previous frame. So this is a problem that makes the compressor slower. It could make the compressor way slower, but it generally doesn't impact the decompressor at all because the decompressor has a very straightforward computation to recover the deltas with the motion vector. So that means maybe I don't mind using quite a bit more computation time with the usual logic that the compressor is usually allowed to take a lot longer than the decompressor is. Um, in general, because video is complicated and sort of arbitrary, we don't know, there is no overarching structure to a video frame in the most general sense. The only way to guarantee that your motion vector is the absolute best is to just try every possible motion vector up to a couple of minor optimizations, that's probably the best you can do. Um, so there are a few things where you could rule out obvious cases, where if you notice a region where the deltas are likely to be incredibly high, you could avoid searching that region. But in general, in the worst case, the way to find the best one is to search for every, is to try every possible vector. In other words, scan over every possible pixel of the uh, previous frame and use that as the upper left corner of your shifted block. That, of course, is going to take an incredibly long uh, time to do. So assuming that this is not computationally feasible, here are a couple of alternatives that rely on some assumptions that on average will probably produce a pretty decent match um, if there is a good match available at all um, and um, rely also on, on sort of assumptions about the behavior of the measurements you're likely to use. So one pretty simple technique is local search. It's to observe that if there is motion, I mean, we know that a motion vector doesn't have to capture literal motion, but we know if motion actually is happening, it probably happens fairly locally. If the frame is, if I move the camera incredibly quickly and the motion actually is the width of the frame, then it's unlikely that motion compensation with a capital M, so for actual motion, can, can do very much for me. If I'm seeing gradual motion, like the pair in the earlier image, Images, the motion is probably relatively um, slight. It's probably relatively subtle. And that me and then in a typical scene, so as opposed to cases where the camera is whipping around quickly, in a typical scene where a camera moves or members or, or things in the scene move, they typically move relatively slowly at the scale of one frame out of 30 frames per second. So it makes sense if I go looking for motion vectors to constrain my search to, a, a, to some defined area around the current block. Now this, this means I'm searching, um, I'm trying every motion vector inside of uh, this gray rectangle, including motion vectors that are actually inside of the current block, because the motion could have just been intra-block motion. It could have been um, at a scale smaller than the width of the current block. So I could just search that. Of course, that is much easier than searching the entire image. I have an 8 by 8 block, and I search to an eight, a radius of 8 in every direction around it, then I'm certainly doing a lot less computation than if I were searching the entire 1,000 by 19, or, or 1,900 by um, 
If I have a 1920 by 1080 pixel image, I'm doing a lot less work with a local search than by searching the entire image. And even better, because the search window is up to me, I'm the compressor, I can decide whether I even use motion compensation at all. It's all up to me. I could choose the window size on the fly. So every single motion vector I search for, I could choose the window size based on my perception of how long I have for my search. If I notice that the search is taking too long, I could just stop searching. So I can choose how long I spend searching based on observations about whether I'm getting a good match and whether I have very much time left to compress this frame before I have to start compressing the next one. So local search will work pretty well if the motion is relatively subtle, which is pretty common. So on, if you look at the average live action video, motion is relatively subtle. Um, and if I have high speed motion, um, or if the video has a very low frame rate, which means that motion is exaggerated, then maybe I don't catch that as much with local search. Um, another option is what, well, basically, if we think of this as sort of the equivalent of linear search, sort of the exhaustive search, our, our minds as algorithms people go immediately to, oh, if linear search doesn't is, is too slow, let's try binary search. So I'm going to call this binary search. I, it, it is sort of binary search. It's just that we're not searching a sorted array. I mean, unlike binary search in the theoretical sense, we don't have any assurances that the image is well behaved. So it doesn't really work like binary search. It's an approximation scheme. We could also therefore call it logarithmic search to, to not make people, not give people false hope. Um, so what I'm going to do is, in this di to illustrate the technique, I'm going to use this black square to indicate the center of a block. And my goal with the motion vector is to find uh, the center of the displaced block. So suppose my current block is, I don't know, like over here. I'm going to search the previous frame for a new place to position my block such that the match is as good as possible. Like binary search, I will start in the center of my previous frame. And then at every step, I will spread out evenly in four directions or maybe in eight directions around my current center point. So I'll start in the center of the image and I'll spread out in all four uh, directions from there. So, so up, down, left, and right, um, outwards, diagonally. I could spread out in eight, I could spread out in 16 or some arbitrary number, whatever. I spread out and then of those four possibilities, I choose the best one, whichever is the best match. Okay, and then I, and then I adopt this as my new center point. And then I spread out evenly and I choose the best match. And I spread out evenly and I choose the best match. Now, the problem with this is the logic feels satisfying because if the image were well behaved, then it might be the case that if this is a good match, then all of the good matches are in this neighborhood. But that's not generally true. It could be that the best match is here. It could even be that of the four I tried originally, this was the worst of the four, and yet the actual best match in the whole image is right next door. I have no way of knowing. Um, but the idea is, on average, I may never find the best motion vector. I just want a good one. I want to try a bunch of possibilities and hopefully narrow them down to the point that I get a pretty good motion vector. I'll settle for a suboptimal one if I can find one that helps me. So this idea is, well, maybe this region of the image isn't where the best motion vector lives, but if it is where the best of the four that I tried was, maybe this is a good place to start searching. Uh, and so I narrow it down and hopefully what I end up with is a decent choice. But it's true that there is a lot of uncertainty here and I could miss out on a lot of good opportunities. Um, so it won't necessarily produce an optimal match, but it's fast enough. It, I mean, notice how I didn't have to do that many trials. Um, and it allows me to spread out among the, Im the parts of the image pretty well, which is good so I don't get stuck in some local area, but I might miss a lot of detail. Um, one refinement is to not throw away as many things at each step, to instead treat the spreading out process as a set of trials and eliminate the worst options, but not necessarily narrow it down to one best option. This, of course, is going to require a lot more computation time, but maybe we've got computation time to spare. So here, I'm going to spread out, let's say, with a factor of four. But at each step, I won't throw away the three worst uh, possibilities. I'll just throw away a few of the worst possibilities. So I'll spread out to a certain radius, and then I'll chop off all but, let's say, the best five. So I keep the best five out of the huge number of, what, 64 or 16 or something that I had. Um, so I chop off everything but the best five, and then I spread out more from the best five, and at each step I just cut off, I don't know, the worst 80%. So 
what I'm doing is spreading out a bit more magnanimously. I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket, but I'm still saving a lot of time, and I do still get the chance to explore a wider area of the image, a more broad area of, of the image than I would with local search. I might also even consider combining this with, so if my, if my original block were down here, I might do a combination of logarithmic search to find some good matches elsewhere, and local search in the neighborhood around my block, and then if any of the ones I found elsewhere are really, really good, I might do local search around those to some extent. So of course I can combine techniques. This is entirely basically a heuristic exercise because I don't want to try and do this the optimal way because it would probably be way too slow. I want some compromise that gives me good results on average. Um, there are a few other heuristics I could employ. Um, so one of them is, I, I don't necessarily want the best motion vector. If it takes five times as long to find a motion vector that's 20% better, maybe it's not worth it. So one thing I could do with motion vector searches is once I get a motion vector that is above a certain threshold that's good enough, I just stop. I leave it and I go on to the next block. Um, that means I can save computation time for the next block where maybe it's harder to find a good motion vector. That's a good way to save time. And notice, again, this trade-off between compression performance and time because I need to keep them both in check. Another interesting idea is to observe that there's likely locality between blocks. If I have two blocks that are next to each other, and I find a good motion vector in this direction, let's stop doing this one. Let's say that my motion vector points this way. If for this block here, the motion vector points up and to the right, well then it's pretty likely that the block one to the, the one next to it, the one next door, has a motion, a good motion vector is the same one, or very close to it. So what I could do is, if I've already found a good motion vector for the neighbor, block, I could start the search for the current block using that vector as a starting point. And then maybe I can search in a window nearby that direction. Um, and, and so again, the heuristic here is that, it, you know, if I'm observing motion in the image, the motion might be global or might not, but it's very likely that any motion I see in one block will also be affecting the block right next door. And so I can save some search time by doubling, uh, uh, doubling up in a sense. One other option, although this is more of a theoretical thing, is to use a little bit of randomization. So when you're choosing positions to search, don't fan out uniformly uh, uh, around the current block or whatever, because maybe you're in an image that has that demonstrates certain odd patterns that, that frustrate that. If you add a random perturbation, then it doesn't really matter how the image looks. You still, on average, will be able to, to break out of a rut that you find yourself stuck into and maybe still find a good motion vector. So all of these, of course, are heuristics. Um, and if you implement motion compensation on assignment four and you want to go beyond local search, you probably will want to combine a bunch of these. So don't search too carefully. Use a, use a cutoff. Use block locality to avoid having to do an exhaustive search for every single block to save some effort, and maybe do a combination of local search and some other option like logarithmic search. And that brings us to one last thing, a sort of coda. This isn't really even a compression topic, this is actually a video compression specific thing which is up until this point, we've been talking about video compression and of course compression in general as if the decompressor receives everything from the compressor uh, from the beginning all the way to the end. And then the decompressor can decode everything starting at the beginning and working, way, working its way to the end. Although maybe some frames arrive out of order, we can assume the decompressor always receives all of the frames that were sent in the same order that they were sent and they all arrive without any errors. Um, and we also earlier in the course have talked about, well, what do we do if there's corruption in transit? So if the file gets mangled in some way, well, we've said that's not our problem. We're compression people, not error recovery people. That's a whole nother course, maybe next year. Um, but for video compression, we do maybe need to think a bit about that because in video compression, although whether or not corruption occurs in transit, I mean, there are ways to prevent that or, or insulate against that by sending things twice or allowing resending things. Um, maybe in video, we can't do that. Maybe we can. Corruption in transit isn't our biggest concern, but one thing we have to think about is if this is a video stream that's the result of live streaming and you tune in here, you start watching at frame number three, how are you going to see the video? You've never seen frame zero, one, or two. The first thing you receive is frame number three. Or actually, to make it even more realistic, you tune into the stream like here you receive the last little bit of the B frame number two, and then you see frame three and everything after that. How are you going to watch this video? I'm gonna call this recovery. 
And this happens all the time. Schemes have to be designed to allow this. If you were to try to render frame number three without knowing what it depends upon, you'd see a bunch of strange artifacts. I can't easily show them to you because this is a, these are slides with still images, but if you look up a video of like MPEG artifacts and you see them, I'll bet that they look familiar. I bet you've seen them before in your life. So this is stream recovery. I want the option for somebody to tune in five hours into a video stream and still be able to see the content after some reasonable delay. So an example here is, um, if you tune in in the middle of frame number two, I think it's fair to say that you're gonna have to miss frame three, frame four, and frame five. But the stream should be designed so that you can start decoding at frame six and then keep viewing after that. So as soon as you see an iframe, you should begin to, you should be able to decode starting there. It's okay to miss a few frames in the meantime because remember three frames is about one tenth of a second. But we want the ability for somebody to tune in midway through a stream and at some point recover the stream and be able to watch because a live stream could last for days or weeks or months. So we've seen that we can validate decompressed data, like, like what Deflate does with the CRC, but not actually how to recover it. And in lossless compression, we pretty much can't. I mean, if the, if the data is corrupted, hopefully we know, but even if we know, we can't fix it. Um, but in video, maybe things are different. We might want to start decoding midway through the stream. So you might uh, tune into a live stream um, over the internet, uh, but a, a more practical and everyday example of that, at least in the past, was you turn on a digital TV box, uh, and of course, the TV has been broadcasting for years. Uh, I mean, you turn the TV on and you start watching, and within maybe half a second or so, you want to be able to actually see the picture, even though the, the, the uh, video data stream has been streaming for days, weeks, or months by that point uh, for over-the-air broadcast TV or digital cable. Uh, and so, although I'm willing to allow a certain amount of delay while the decompressor gets its bearings, I want somebody who tunes into my video stream to be able to start watching it even if the early part of the stream got missed. If you choose to pursue this on assignment four, the way that we will model that behavior for our purposes is we'll create your compressed video file and then delete up to it. We'll just choose an arbitrary point in the file and just wipe it out. We'll just delete all of it and start and then truncate the file to that point and see what happens if we feed that into your decompressor. Now, that's an option you, that is optional for the assignment. If you choose to pursue that as one of the things for extra marks, that is how we'll test it. If we used only iframes, recovery wouldn't be so tough. If you tune in midway through frame two, you're not gonna get frame two. You've lost frame two. But if you have some way of knowing that frame three is beginning, you can start decoding as soon as you get frame three and keep moving from there. Now that isn't trivial. If you start decoding in the middle of frame two, how will you know how long frame two is? Maybe the, the length of frame two isn't obvious if you start decoding in the middle of, I don't know, like a prefix coding bitstream. So you need some way of indicating this this is the beginning of a new frame. So even somebody who's lost in the wilderness knows when they've reached the beginning of the next frame. You could do this by adding a magic number to the bitstream. Um, JPEG has some clever tricks for this. Um, you could do this, and I think PNG might as well. Um, you can do this using a, some kind of marker. So some pattern in the bitstream that tells anybody watching, even somebody who's lost their bearings, that they are now at the beginning of an iframe. And if you have a stream of only iframes, then recovery can, uh, you can recover localized to the very next frame um, in every case. But of course, some streams aren't only iframes, probably the streams you are producing. In a stream with, uh, that has P frames, it's reasonable that if you tune in um, after the beginning of the most recent iframe, you're going to lose both that frame and reasonably you'll also lose all the frames that depend on it. But again, if you um, sprinkle iframes uniformly enough into your stream, so let's say maybe one iframe per second or two iframes per second, then you should be able to recover the stream at the next iframe within less than a second. So full stream recovery, obviously, we'll have to sacrifice P frames and B frames if you tune in before, uh, 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 in the middle of an iframe and you, and you miss the details for that iframe. Um, it's of course difficult for B, uh, the difficulty in increases with B frames present because now the frames are arriving out of order, which can make a real mess out of things. If you tune in here, if you tune in just one and a half frames into the stream, what have you lost? Okay, well, you, you, you've lost frame three, but you've also lost frames one and two because they depend on frame three. You've also lost frame five because that depends on frame three, and you've also lost frame four because that depends on frame three too, which means you're stuck until frame six. You tune in, um, 
uh, one and a half frames in and you lose uh, the next four and a half frames. Actually, even if you tune in 0 0.5 frames in, you lose all of these things. In general, until you've seen an iframe, um, you're sort of out of luck. And in some cases, you're out of luck until you've seen two iframes. Because there could, I guess theoretically at least, there could be frames that depend on frame six and frame five or something uh, in the mix. Um, so it, it's reasonable for a stream recovery procedure to fail when you're in the middle of a bunch of P frames and B frames. And that means that if you have the ability to reconstruct the stream starting at an iframe, you also need to ensure that iframes occur relatively frequently. Um, so that means that, that schemes that are used for broadcast television or for live streaming generally are deliberately constrained so that iframes occur at a certain frequency, like let's say twice per second. If iframes occur twice per second, then you're looking at downtime of maybe one second in the absolute worst case if you tune into a stream midway so that a decompressor um, who tunes in and misses some stuff can pick things up, can recover stuff within about a second. And remember that iframes take up tons of space. Iframes are taking up what, maybe like almost a hundred times as much space as a B-frame. And so ha forcing that there be tons and tons of I-frames is going to diminish your compression advantage pretty substantially. And so keep in mind that the advantages observed by schemes that we, that we use these days and schemes that were used a long time ago, like MPEG-1, when they say that, that they expect a, a certain um, compression advantage, that's usually under the assumption that we have two I-frames per second. And if you um, relax that constraint, you can really amplify your compression advantage. Um, so uh, if you have video, so actually, yeah, even if we, I, sh I forgot this point, um, even media like video files and discs will typically require iframes at regular intervals because if you want to fast forward, if, if I want to skip to one hour into the video, like many of you might have done on this video, if you want to skip to midway through a video, you have to have some way of recovering the stream. If I want to seek to this point in my video stream, what do I do? Well, either I go find the next iframe and I just ignore everything in between, or I go find the previous iframe, so I, I back up a little bit until I have the previous iframe, I decode everything to this point, and then start us up here as if I was already decoding, which of course is computationally intensive. If I want to start three frames into my thing, I have to go back and find an iframe, decode four frames, and then pick things up. Which means if I'm working with a video file that has one iframe for the entire file, and I want to skip to one hour into a two hour video, I have to decode one entire hour of video just to fast forward, just to skip to halfway in. So most formats require iframes at some reasonable interval, maybe once every second, maybe once every five seconds, so that seeking and fast forwarding and recovery becomes reasonably easy and doesn't require a huge amount of decoding. But that is formally optional. You could have a video stream that has only one iframe for the entire stream, but good luck if you want to seek into that stream. And iframes, because they inflate the bitrate, there is a bit of an incentive to try and reduce the number of iframes, except that it does lead to some difficulties with recovery and with seeking. But I think we're out of time. We're out of time for this lecture. I'm going to go get some lunch and we are out of time for the course, but it's good because we're done. This is our last topic and we're done the course. Uh, and that means that finally we can all call ourselves compression experts. But actually, you know, you don't have to be a compression expert to realize that after all of this, the best type of compression, I think, is a good old fashioned hug. <laughs>